Amen. Awesome. Well, um, this morning I'm going to talk to you in the subject of undeserved grace. Undeserved grace. And I'm going to read uh, scripture in Luke chapter 19, verse 9 and 10. Luke chapter 19, verse 1 and 10. I believe they have it up on the screen. So you guys can just follow me. It's cool. Okay, says this. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus, and he was a chief tax collector, and he was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, <laughs> but because he was short, <laughs> I'm sorry, I mean, that's what the Bible says, my bad. <laughs> but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. Verse 4. <laughs> so he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him. Since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter. He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. But Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house. Because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came, up, came to seek and save the lost. Undeserved grace. Um, hum, you know, the world that we live in, we all want fair. What's fair? Um. I came from Seattle about a couple of months ago. I only, I've been living in Oregon for the past, I don't know, seven, eight months. And how many of you guys have been to Seattle? Yeah, well, almost everyone. So in Seattle, we have this thing which is called the ferry. Um, and I love to ride the ferry. That's one of my favorite things to do. And one time, one afternoon, I decided to go um, to go with my parents to take the ferry to, to, the, um, to the near island. And if you don't catch the ferry on time, check this out. If you don't catch the ferry on time, then you have to wait in line for the ferry to, to turn around, to come back. And sometimes you wait 45 minutes to an hour. So I was driving. I was pretty sure I was going to catch the ferry on time. I got there, and I could see the ferry leaving. It's like, no, don't leave me. So I had to wait. I was like, you know what? It's cool. That means I get to sit, wait in front of the line. As soon as the ferry gets here, I'm going to be the first one going into the ferry. That's great. That's cool. You know, we got out of the car. We started taking pictures. Oh, that's great. And then people started to arrive too. And I was like, oh, yeah, I'd like to be the first one on the line. That makes me feel good. That means I'm on time. Anyways, we started talking to my family. And... Once you get to the line, sometimes you leave a space, you know, um, for people. When, they, when, when the ferry turns around, there's people obviously getting out of the, uh, of the ferry. So you leave enough space for people to, 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 to drive by. Anyways, I got distracted when all of a sudden I see a lady driving and parking right in front of me. What? Are you kidding me? I turn around and my parents are like, who do you think this lady is? I've been waiting here for 40 minutes and she just right by me and she parks right in front of me. Are you kidding me? So I was like, this ain't happening. I started, you know, throwing the fist. I was like, you know what? I'm not going to get out of my car. My parents are like, wait, Israel, it's okay, not a big deal. No, it is a big deal. I've been waiting here for 40 minutes. I was here on time and this lady came out of nowhere and she just stands right in front of me. What? It ain't happening, not in my watch. 
I got out of my car, got out of the window. Lady, excuse me. And she, and I could see like she was kind of lost. Excuse me, lady. Roll down the window. I need to talk to you. Roll down the window. And she was confused. She didn't know what was happening. She rolled out the window and was like, yes, can I help you? Uh, what do you think you're doing? And for whatever reason, every time we think we're right, you know, we try to get everyone's attention and everyone's agreement. Hello, excuse me, officer. Is anyone here? Hey, this lady just got on the line. Lady, you can't do that. Were you here on time? No, I just got here. So what makes you think that she just showed up any, out of anywhere and just, just caught in line? She's like, well, uh, I didn't know what to do. I'm new in the city. I was like, well, that's why you ask. Ask people, and they will tell you what to do. You didn't show up out of the nowhere, and you just, you know, just park in front of the, of the line. And she was just freaking out. She was like, well, lady, if you're late, then that means you belong to the back of the line. You took my spot. I was the first one. I was always at the ferry. Like, can you tell? And she was freaking out. And everyone would just look at him. It's like, who is this guy? Like, it's not a big deal. Everyone's got to get into the ferry. But I just wanted to be first. She took my spot. Are you kidding me? What is wrong with people? How many of you guys have had, like, had that before to you? Like, people kind of like, if you're a Christian, right? Right? The coolness of being Christian, like, it's gone. Right? Like, you just want to, like, shoot those people. It's like, what are you doing? So this lady was just freaking out. She didn't know what to do. My parents come and get me. They got me, and they put me into the car. And it's like, it's, it's okay. You know, everything is okay. But I just kept saying, what? But why? I was here first. Like, why does she think she is? Like, wh- it's okay. You know what the funny thing is? Like I was saying to you at the beginning, we live in the world that everything, it's about being fair. If you do bad, then you get bad, right? If you committed a crime, then you have to pay for it. Isn't that right? If you're late for a a concert, if you're late for your class, then, oh, well, go back to the line. That's where you belong, right? Like, you ain't cool enough. Who do you think you are? But you know what? Jesus doesn't roll that way. Jesus does not see fair the same way you and I see it. The word of God says that the first shall be last and last shall be what? Shall be first. Well, I, I, I definitely did not remember that when I was yelling to the lady. I wanted fair. I wanted to be right. She was late. Well, then she goes back to the line. But now, if we're going to talk about being fair, now, if we're going to talk about giving people to what they deserve, then let's go back and see the story of Zacchaeus. And verse 2 says this, a man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector. And check this out. And he was wealthy. That means he had money. He was rich. He had everything that he needed. He had everything that he wanted. But not just that. He was working for the Roman Empire. He was a Jew working for the Roman Empire. But check this out. The Roman Empire became powerful because they went to towns, villages, Burned down their homes, raped women, killed men, and children were taken as slaves. Zacchaeus was working for those people. When someone was called a sinner, it was a derogatory word. It's like it was like calling someone a dog. Zacchaeus was like almost like a dog. He was cheating his own people out of their money. He was taking their money away. And as far as I know, those kind of people, they belong in prison, right? Those kinds of people, they deserve the worst. Those kinds of people deserve the hatred of everyone else. Why? Because they're taking advantage of the weak. They're taking advantage of the people that don't have much and they take everything away. That was the key. Let's talk about being fair. 
Zacchaeus was a jerk. He cheated people. He deserved the worst. <laughs> and if I was me, I would probably would have called like the FBI, the DAA or whatever. It's like, hey, you need to take this guy back to where he belongs. What is this guy doing out of the streets cheating people out of their money? Who do you think he is? But you know what the funny thing is? That Jesus does not see people the way that you and I see it. You know what? When Jesus was passing by, when Jesus was walking through the town with his disciples and the people, he says that he stopped, that he stopped at the spot. He saw a short guy climbing on the tree, and he looked at him and said, Zacchaeus, he didn't call him, hey, thief, hey, you liar, come down. The word of God says that Jesus said his name, Zacchaeus. Unfortunately, a lot of the times, right, we live with that fear that if people find out what we do and who we are, then people will point fingers at us and they will tell us who we really are. I've been in that place. And to be honest with you, I'm here standing before you not because I'm perfect, because sometimes I lie. Sometimes, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm greedy. Sometimes I'm an evil person. Because I live in a sin world, sinful world. I'm not better than you. But I have understood that the grace of God has covered all my sin. That the love and the grace of God makes me a worth it person. Jesus calls Zacchaeus by his name. He knows, Jesus knows who you are. The more you try to hide, the more you try to run away from him, the more, the more you feel cool about it, like you're too cool for Sunday school. Well, guess what? Jesus is cooler than you and I. Jesus will go where you are. Jesus will find you at the place that you think you're hiding from everyone else. But he will be there and he will call you by your name. Because Jesus does not need you, but Jesus wants you. Jesus wants your heart. Jesus does not see your sin. Jesus sees your heart. And he wants that. Something that I learned from a pastor, that he says this. The devil knows your name, but he calls you by your sin. But God knows your sin, but he calls you by your name. He knows what you've done, but he calls you your son, his daughter. He paid a price for you. Verse 7 says this. No, verse 3 and 4 says this. He wanted to see who Jesus was. But because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see who Jesus was. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house. Jesus did not invite, he did not invite himself to Zacchaeus' house. He did not say, hey, Zacchaeus, yo. Do you mind if I come over to your house? Jesus didn't say, hey, yo, it's, I mean, is that okay if I just go and crash over your house? Right? Jesus said, hey, yo, come down, because right now, today, I'm going to have a meal with you. It was not a request. It was a demand. How many of you guys like people to come over to your house without being invited? <laughs> Two people. Well. Zacche Jesus was saying, Zacchaeus, I need to talk to you. What? Let's talk about being fair. Out of everyone, out of all the people that Jesus was with, his disciples, out of everyone, maybe there was needy people close to him. Maybe there were followers of Jesus that, that, that were with Jesus everywhere he went. Out of everyone, Jesus decided to stop to have a meal with the worst person in that crowd. Jesus could have had a meal with his disciples. Jesus could have had a meal, right, with the person that, they, that he just healed. But Jesus decided 
to have a meal with the dog. Jesus decided to have a meal with the worst person during those times. Jesus decided to stop the crowd, the disciples, the sick, the lame, because he wanted to have a meeting with the worst person in that town. You know what? <laughs> That's not fair. What? Are you kidding me? Why would Jesus do that? I'm pretty sure there was needy people all around him. But why would Jesus stop to be in the house of a sinner? <laughs> that doesn't make sense. You know, the beauty of Jesus is when everyone is calling you for what you did wrong, Jesus is calling you for what you're worth. You know, I've done things that I'm not proud. And you know what? People have pointed fingers at me. You know, people have called me hypocrite. People have called me a liar. And you know what? And to be honest with you, maybe I do deserve that. But when I read, but when I read God's word, when I understand that Zacchaeus is me, that Zacchaeus, like I could see myself in Zacchaeus, when I understand that Jesus has decided to stop by my house, to stop by my work, to stop by my school, and that Jesus had decided to have a close relationship with me regardless of my sins, regardless of the mistakes that I made. He, when I see that, when I discover that, you know what? There is nowhere else that I could go and I can turn to but to the love of God. There is no place that I would rather be than being in the presence of God. Grace is the most beautiful thing that you and I could experience. Colossians chapter 2 verse 13 and 14 says this. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins Having canceled our debt, which stood against us and condemned us, he has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. What? Christ Jesus forgave my sins? He says that he forgave the sins that you and I committed today, this morning. Maybe last night when you were watching the things on your computer that you shouldn't be watching. You know what? Jesus forgave that sin. It's so incredible. Check this out. It's so incredible that high school students, the junior high students, that they're struggling and dealing with porn. Like you have no idea. Every time I have the chance to speak to students from our church, there are students, there are young, young, young people crying because they're dealing with porn. And maybe some of you guys know what I'm talking about. Sometimes they're ashamed to tell someone else because they think you're dirty, because they're going to think you're a perv, because you're going to think you're, you're just a bad person. And it's just unbelievable that those students, sometimes they want to get out of it, but because they're afraid, because they're ashamed, because they don't know what to do, they're still living under their sin. But according to Colossians, it says that Jesus forgave our sins. He canceled our debt. We were guilty of the things that we did. But Jesus said, you know what? I forgave you. This word says that nothing, nothing that you do, nothing that you say will separate you from the love of God. I don't do good to get good. That's what religion is all about. I don't try to read my Bible so that I can be a better Christian, so that God can love me more. I don't go to church so God can hear me when I pray. You know what? I grew up in church, and I grew up scared because I thought I was going to go to hell every time I sinned. Because that's what I learned. The 
grace of God has covered all sin. Jesus forgave Zacchaeus for all of his sins. The law condemned Zacchaeus, but Jesus forgave Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus deserved to die, but Jesus died for Zacchaeus. Jesus was willing to take the blame and the shame for Zacchaeus, and he's willing to take that away from you and I this morning. He loves you just the way that you are. He's calling you by your name. He wants to have a relationship with you. I'm going to tell your story and I'm going to close with this. The last part of Colossians says this, that he took away our sins... He took away our shame, our mistakes, our nastiness, and he nailed it to the cross. God sent his son to die for the, for the dog, Zacchaeus. And you know what? Out of my eyes, that's not fair. But in the eyes of God, that is called grace. Grace is God does good even when I do bad. I'm going to tell you a story. But a couple of months ago, I was visiting home. Can, can I just get some music or something? Let's just try to get some spiritual. A couple of months ago, uh, my parents are pastors down in Seattle. And they invited a, a preacher to go speak at our church. We didn't know who this preacher was. We didn't know how he looked like. So he just went and preached. And once he got up to speak, he looked normal. I mean, he was doing great. And out the middle of his sermon, he shared a story. And I'm going to share it with you. And he said this. He goes, there was a man and his son, a father and a son. The son was going you know, he was a high school student. He was a good Christian. He had a good grades. Um, he went to church. He read his Bible. So he's a, he was a pretty good kid. His name was Joseph. But Joseph had a friend named Carl. Carl, he was a bad kid at school. He was a troublemaker. He was going in and out of jail. He was using weed all the time. You know, he dropped out of school. So pretty much, he was a pretty bad kid. And Joseph kept telling his dad, Dad, I don't know what to do with Carl. You know, he thinks he's way too cool that every time he's trying to do something stupid, he ended up in jail. I don't know what to do. I tried to tell him about Jesus, but he refused. I tried to tell him about the love of God, and he thought I was crazy. I tried to tell him about having a relationship with God, but he didn't know what a healthy relationship was. So I don't know what else to do, Dad. So the father, the father, the, the pastor said this, Well, son, why don't we do this? Why don't you take your friend Carl out fishing? You and I take Carl out fishing, and maybe, you know, we can just talk to him. Maybe we can just pray for him and see what happens. Okay, great. Joseph decided to invite Carl to the fishing trip, and Carl accepted it. That was cool. The following day, they, they got the boat ready, you know, all the fishing equipment, everything to go and have a great day out in the ocean. They packed everything they needed. Anyways, they went out in the ocean, they were fishing, everything seemed great. Carl was having a good time. Joseph was having a better time because he, he, Carl was with them and with his dad. What they forgot to do was to check the weather before they went out to the sea. All of a sudden, you know, a storm hit their boat. Waves began to crash into this little boat. They were not ready. They were not prepared. 
And unfortunately, there were only two life jackets. Two. Which is normally what uh, 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 Joseph's dad had for him and for his dad. Only two. Unfortunately, one of these waves were so big that he crashed into the boat. And the boat just like parted in half. They couldn't make it back to shore. The storm was so heavy that they couldn't do it. The boat was sinking. And the first reaction, Joseph's reaction was to put his life vest on first so that he could help the other two kids. One side of the boat, it was Joseph. And he, he was clinging to the boat, asking, screaming for help. At the other side, it was Carl, that he was also hanging into the boat really tightly and asking for help. There was only one life jacket. And Joseph's dead. His first reaction, why, you know what? I want to save my son. Are you kidding me? He is my son. He's a good kid. He eats, goes to church. He reads the Bible. He's great. Why would I want to save Carl? He's going to die anyways. He's really going to end up killed. Why would I save him? But there was a voice inside of him right at that minute. It says, you need to save Carl and not Joseph. And inside of him, he was just mad. I was like, what? What are you talking about? I can't do that. But they had to make a choice. Both of them were drowning. Both of them were about to just be taken away from the water. But he, just, he looked at his son. The father looked at his son in the eyes and said, Son, don't ever forget this. I love you so, so much. I thank you for being a good son. And at that moment, he decided to throw the life jacket to Carl. And his son, in a matter of seconds, drowned. Carl was a bad kid. Carl survived. They went back to shore. They got all the help they needed. And as, as this pastor was talking and was sharing this story, he fell into his knees crying. And we're like, what's going on? And this is what he said. You know, Carl, that bad kid, that no one wanted to hang out with him, that no one cared for him. The Carl that deserved to die that night on the boat is a person right here that you see in front of you speaking to you right now. It was because that father, the pastor, decided to give me a new chance so that I could live and so that I could turn my life around and so that I could be standing here in front of you preaching about the love and the grace of God. And you know what? You and I deserved to die. You and I, right there where you're sitting, and myself, including myself, deserve to die. But God sent His only Son, the only thing that He had, Jesus, to come down onto earth to go and die for you and for me so that you and I can be here sitting right now and singing and worshiping. Jesus decided to give Zacchaeus one more chance. When Zacchaeus went to the house, he says that, that he wanted to give everything to the people that he stole from. He wanted to give everything because he had experienced the love and the grace of Jesus. Zacchaeus didn't need anything because he had it all. But he didn't have Jesus in his life. I don't know your sin. I don't know your life. I don't know what you do in secret. But you know what? The Father does. And he wants to reach out to you. He's calling you by your name. He's calling you what the purpose that you have in life. He's not pointing fingers at you. 
He's pointing the cross at you. The cross that forgives, the cross that restores, the cross that loves, and the cross that makes us all new. And how do we respond to that grace? How do we respond to that love? Well, first, you need to view yourself right. Your identity, it's not porn. Your identity, it's not lost. Your identity, it's not being a liar. That's not who you are. You are a child of God who sometimes we do bad. You need to understand your identity. Recognize and confess the truth regarding your sin. To confess biblically, biblically means to agree with God about, about what you and Him both know to be true. Confession is not a formula. It's not a process. It's regarding your sin and your life saying, God, yes, I'm sorry. I agree that I have done wrong. Confession isn't complete without repentance. Repentance means to change your mind about sin, to mourn its ugliness. It's just to say, God, please help me. Help me to live different. Help me to stay away from the things that I've been doing wrong. Repentance isn't, repentance isn't repentance until you change something. And lastly, repentance leads to dependence. When you repent, when you recognize your sin, you depend on the love and the grace of God. You know what, guys? Every time, every morning that I get up, I need to, God, I need to ask God for forgiveness. I need to recognize that there's sin in my life and that I need the cross to change me, to restore me. I want everyone just to close your eyes in this moment. I know there is people here, but when you see yourself at the mirror, you see someone else. And that you're trying to change that about yourself. You're trying to pursue love in the places or the, with the people that you shouldn't be pursuing love with. God gave his only son for you and for me. He's pursuing you with everything because he wants you. Because he believes in you. Because he wants the best for you. Because you have a purpose. Because you have a plan. He doesn't want you to perish. He doesn't want you to die. The grace of God covers every sin. I'm going to ask some of the teachers, the professors, if they can come up front and they can help me pray. Zacchaeus was willing to, to leave the status behind, to leave his money behind. He didn't care if people were going to talk about him. He was willing to climb on a tree to see who Jesus, to see what Jesus was all about. Zacchaeus wanted to experience Jesus. He didn't care. This morning, what are you willing to do? Are you willing to step out of your chair? Are you willing to climb on the tree and to see what the grace of God is all about? Or are you still going to be living a sinful life? And just wait for the enemy to destroy the purpose and the calling that God has for you. You know what? Sometimes every Sunday I go up to my pastor or to my leaders and say, I'm sorry, I screw up. I need forgiveness. These people right here, you professors, they believe in you. They believe that there's a plan for you. They believe that there's a calling for your life. And the enemy will do, this world will do anything they can to destroy what God has placed in your hands. So if there's you sitting right here and you say, you know what? I want to do things right. You know what? I want to change my life around. You know what? I want to stop doing the things that I'm doing. I want to stop watching the things that I've been watching. I'm sick of it. I'm tired. If that's you, I want you to step in faith. And I want you to come to these people. And I want you to say, help me.
need you to pray for me. Help me. I don't want to be the same. If you want to take what Zacchaeus did, he left everything behind for Jesus. And, Jesus, and Zacchaeus was never, ever the same. I want everyone just to close their eyes and bow your head. As they begin to worship, if that's you, if there's something inside of you, there's a voice speaking to your heart, you know what? Do not avoid it. Get up in your chair and go one of these professors, these teachers, and let them pray for you. Let them show you the grace and the love of Christ this morning. You don't want to live the same. I don't want to live the same. But if that's you, I want you to get up with confidence and go up to these people. Let them pray for you. It doesn't mean that people are going to look at you differently. It doesn't mean that people are going to think differently about you. As a matter of fact, they're going to believe and be praying for you every time they go out in their sleep. So if that's you, why don't you get up in your seat and let them pray for you. And I'm going to pray for you. Heavenly Father. This morning, we have talked about undeserved grace, about what's not fair. But this morning, we come to you seeking your presence, seeking your grace, seeking that cross, seeking you, for I need you more and more and more. Father, you know every person that is sitting in these chairs right now. You know every heart. You know every sin. You know every circumstances. And right now, I just declare that the grace and that the blood of Christ will just come over this room and will just clean us from all sins, from all unrighteousness. Father, that today, this morning, we will come to get to know you in a different way. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.